Authentic Parenting is a free resource, and support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Your contribution helps cover the many costs associated with the production, hosting, and post-production of the show. This is an ad-free podcast, and donations are greatly appreciated. To make a one-time donation in any amount that you desire, or make a monthly donation, go to AuthenticParenting.com forward slash support. Thank you for your generous and kind support. It means the world to me. I am Anna Seewald, and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about growing ourselves while raising our children. I'm a psychologist, educator, and parent coach. And on this podcast, I explore how you can connect to your authentic self, practice radical self-care, and raise emotionally healthy children. Let's break the cycle of generational trauma for a more peaceful, kind, and compassionate world. Today, how to stop holding a grudge. I am speaking with a returning guest, Dr. Judith Rabinor. We have done multiple episodes together. Our initial conversation was the complicated mother-daughter relationship, which was, for that specific year, in the top 10 most downloaded episodes. I absolutely loved the conversation with another remarkable woman, Hope Edelman, the author of Motherless Daughters on Maternal Loss and Grief, my conversation with Judy on cultivating self-care. We also did an episode with Christy Loricella on the power of storytelling and using writing for healing. And today we talk about how to let go of a grudge and be at peace. Dr. Judith Ruskay Rabinor is a clinical psychologist, author of several books, consultant and psychotherapist with offices in New York City and Lido Beach, Long Island. She has four decades of experience working with individuals, couples, groups, and families. For many years, she has specialized in the mother-daughter relationship and eating disorders. In addition to her clinical work with patients, she coaches writers and offers consultation groups for therapists and other mental health practitioners. She has written on the topic of divorce, befriending your ex after divorce, making life better for you, your kids, and yes, your ex. She has written on the topic of eating disorders, called A Starving Madness, Tales of Hunger, Hope, and Healing in Psychotherapy, and her memoir, The Girl in the Red Boots, Making Peace with My Mother. I feel that every time I talk to her, it's like connecting with a beloved family member. She never ceases to amaze me. At 80 years old, her vibrancy, love of life, creativity, humor, and playfulness are forever inspiring. In today's episode, we delve into a topic that affects us all, holding onto grudges. Whether it's a recent conflict or a long-standing resentment, we explore why we hold on to grudges, the impact on our well-being and relationships, and practical strategies for letting go and finding peace. We also explore why some people struggle more than others with letting go, examine the role of trauma and the transformative power of updating our life story to move past feeling stuck, and the significance of developing inner safety and resources in overcoming trauma, and the profound role of gratitude, among other insights. Please enjoy, and thank you for listening. How have you been? I love your new picture. Thank you. I do. And that color is very nice on you, the raspberry color. Thank. Well, that other picture was very old. But first of all, I wrote the book like three years ago. The picture was 10 years earlier. So, <laughs> And now another conversation 
offline is about letting my hair go gray. Oh, I love that. I'm going to say it looks nice, actually. I think so, too. It's a long story, but we don't have that much time. And I'll tell you about it another time. But I do want to tell you that I do have this great room in my building. I don't I think I once took you up for a tour. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Said we do something there. Yes, we should. I think this issue of grudges in parent-child relationships is huge. And I've gotten really interested and I've read a bit about the negativity effect and how we're wired. I'm sure you've read all this stuff too. But, you know, how we translate what we read into our own life is another story, right? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yes. Everybody knows this. I was walking with a friend yesterday and she's saying, I don't know why I hang on to these feelings about my daughter-in-law. In the beginning, she couldn't stand me. You know how long ago the beginning was? 24 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Right. And I know I work with parents, right? who went through divorce and they are co-parents. And sometimes, let's say the divorce happened in 2011 and now it's 2024 and people are still taking each other to court, dealing with the emotional stuff. And you wonder what's going on? Like, why is it hard for people to let go? Or is it that is it an easy process to let go and, you know, forgive? It's easy said than done. But I was thinking, I meet different people in my work, and I'm sure you do too. You know, you have such an extensive psychotherapy experience. There are some people who do hold on to grudges and others who are really have an easy time letting go. Have you noticed that? I have totally noticed this, that, you know, I the word that I didn't learn when I was in training to be a therapist, and maybe you didn't either, is wiring. You know, like, I feel like some people, people, are, we know this, people are wired differently. And there are people that can let it go. They buy the theater ticket for the wrong night. They lost money. All right, it's money. I'm safe. My kids are safe. There are other people that go crazy about it, right? For years, right? Some people hold on to grudges, like you said, for years. And the more we tell a story, the more we reinforce it. So if you tell that story about the theater tickets over and over again, you just reinforce the idea, I'm a loser, I made a mistake, I got chipped, they did this to me, they did this to me, right? And we now know that, first of all, all of us are wired the brain is wired to remember dangerous things because at heart, we are primitive animals and we were in the jungle and behind every corner, there could be a lion or a tiger. You better keep your eyes open. But that's not the world we're living in anymore. And you see the effect of this with people who go crazy on the road, you know, that have road rage and somebody cuts them off and they say, oh, I'm going to go get that person. And then they speed up and like, you're terrified, right? You're on the road thinking, what's wrong with this person? Well, their negativity wiring is so strong. And why is that? We don't know. Is this nature or nurture? Did they learn it from their parents who were also negative? Or were they just wired that way, you know? Yeah, I know. I wonder the same thing oftentimes because I sometimes see people who had severe trauma in their history and they easily let go and forgive people and, you know, and have that forgiveness for whatever has happened to them in their life. And I also see people who didn't have a severe trauma as let's say that other person, but they have a hard time letting go. But I think what you said is, is interesting. And I want to dig in a little bit. You said storytelling. When you tell the same story over and over again, it reinforces the same victim narrative. But don't you think there is storytelling and storytelling, the context, who you tell it to, who listens to your story? You know, you can tell the same story in social settings and, you know, or you can tell the story in a therapeutic setting. It's not the same, right? Even in a therapeutic setting, the wrong question will evoke the wrong story. So you know, a lot has been written about this, that many therapists dwell on what went wrong rather than what went right. And that if we want to set up a growth environment, 
it's important to me to start from the beginning by asking people, how did you get here today? And they'll say they got here today because their husband cheated on them or their kid isn't talking to them or they got fired, but they got here. They got here. They found a resource. Somebody gave them your name or my name. And if it's not a therapist, they called, maybe they called a friend or their sister. So you did something. You didn't stay home and eat or drink vodka at nine in the morning. You called your sister. You called a therapist. You got a referral. So we're always balancing in therapy, I think, what went wrong and what went right. Because what went wrong matters. That's why they're there. They want that to be fixed. But part of how we fix things is helping people recognize their resources, right? Yes, I agree. And highlighting that even that small act of you've taken a positive step towards your healing, you called someone is so important. You're right. Highlighting it and the way we highlight and this, these issues that we're talking about, they apply to clinical situations as well as everyday situations, because everybody listening is going to have somebody call them up today and say, well, everything's okay, but, and then after the but, there's a big story. And the question is, but you're coping with that. Like, it is unfortunate, but life is full of rain showers. It's April, and it's going to rain a lot this month. And it rains on everybody's life. And how do we figure out how to get an umbrella up when it rains? How do we protect ourselves? And some people act as if being negative protects them. But it doesn't. It just reinforces bad feelings. And there's a lot written about how having bad thoughts creates bad health. Having bad thoughts and feeling like you're constantly under attack creates a lot of anxiety. And anxiety screws with your whole nervous system, you know? I know you talk about that a lot on your program. I do. So, but you are raising a really good point. Why are those people holding on to grudges? is you're right. It's a self-protection mechanism that served maybe when they were young, when those traumas or things happened to them, bad things. And I think people get stuck and never update the narrative, the story, the perspective. They sort of adopt the lens through which they see the world and they just go on like that. Even if the think has happened 20 years ago, people still see life through that negative lens. And there are consequences to their mental health, physical health. There are studies, right, that demonstrate that holding on to grudges has negative implication for our mental well-being and physical health. And they bring that same lens into their new relationships, into their parenting. So it's not serving people in many ways. I love that expression, updating the perspective, because that's what we have to do to get out of places that we're stuck. We have to update our perspective. Um, And therapists can really help by asking questions. And we can all help our friends by saying, well, you called me, right? You got up this morning. Are you drinking? No, you're not drinking. So good for you. Did you overeat? You know, we can really help our friends and our relatives by helping them recognize their resources. But you said something that I really want to go back to. I don't know. We both probably have a long list already of things we want to go back to because we have such a good time on the show. You said sometimes people don't have a severe trauma and they still hold on to negativity. And I think it behooves us to really understand that a trauma is how it's experienced. That I know a little about you and you know a little about me. And somebody loses their mother, and that trauma wrecks their life. They spend the rest of their life fearing abandonment, being deserted, being dropped, and every experience gets transformed into a negative experience. And somebody else is helped to understand that even if you lose your mother, there are other people who can mother you. There are other ways you can get mothered and you can learn to mother yourself. And yes, there is a hole in your heart that never goes away. And that's okay. We have to have compassion for the places that we have a hole in our heart. We have all had terrible disappointments. And I did not lose my mother the way you did. But I felt that my mother neglected me. I felt she was careless. I felt she didn't really pay attention. I felt she was emotionally insensitive. 
and I held onto like glue some early events. And I told those stories. I went from therapist to therapist, from writing class to writing class, writing the same story. She did this. She did that. She did this. She did that. And that's really too bad because I felt a lot. I spent a lot of years not appreciating what I got and harboring resentment and anger and sadness uh, over what I didn't get. And we all, nobody got everything. No parent does everything right. Every parent does something wrong. And I'm thankful that at some point in my life, I was able to look back and say, wait a minute, that is not the whole story. And I was able to, thank you, Anna, update my perception, update my perspective, right? Yeah. So what were you seeking? Were you seeking justice? Were you seeking validation? Were you looking for admission of wrongdoing from your mother? You know, because you're right, like people, there is benefits to holding on to grudges. It serves you. It's your narrative because who would you be without that story, right? Like that's also a threat to yourself. I mean, you're asking me the right question and I'm going to try to answer it. What benefit did I get out of being a victim rather than a survivor? Oh, what was me? You better listen to me. I really have a story, right? What benefit did I get out of being a victim? I was hoping that I would get love and admiration and appreciation from my mother and from anybody who heard my story. Let me pause for one moment and ask you, sure. that love and admiration that you said you were seeking from your mother, were you getting love and admiration in that later stage in life from your mother or you were still stuck in the childhood story that you didn't get? Well, I was stuck in a childhood story and that story made me oblivious and blind to what was going on in my real life. I was blind. And, you know, there's a lot of books written about like the oversensitive person. And I think when we get hurt, whether we call it trauma or not, and we should come back to this word trauma, because trauma is really overused. Like I think losing your mother as a young child is indeed a trauma. That is a trauma. But your mother not picking you up, uh, you know, from the ball game. And you standing in the rain for an hour or two, uh, you know, or you being scared. Well, that might be a trauma and might not be a trauma. It depends. It depends how it's experienced. And if a child has enough internal resources that they're standing in the rain waiting for their mother to pick them up, they can say, I know mom will be here. She must be late. But if they don't have enough internal resources, they're terrified. And so a lot of this depends on the age of the what happens and the stage of development and what happened previously. And, you know, we as therapists are always trying, tell me if you agree with me, to create a sense of internal security in people. So no matter what happens to you, you say, this happened, this happened, and I lived. This happened, I lived, and I can have compassion for myself because it really wasn't perfect, but it's okay. And actually, you might have learned something from it. You might have learned how secure you were, how independent you could be. You might have learned that you really had survival skills, even though you were young. So, I mean, it's just so many different components of what leads a person to be secure. But I would venture to say that people who are telling the same old boring story about their divorce or their childhood, um, they're really very insecure and they're really looking for support, compassion. I don't think they think they're looking for pity, but they might often be getting pity, right? But that security didn't originate in the divorce or as a result of divorce. Don't you think that sense of security was living there dormant and it just was provoked by a modern day experience? Do you think that security was rooted in childhood? That's a great question. I mean, you know, such a large number of people get divorced. Some children, they tell that divorce story over and over again. But of course, divorces go in many different directions. Some parents get divorced and they're really relieved to be out of the marriage and they're collaborative parents together. And children may feel sad that their image of what their family is 
is broken up, but they immediately can begin to know, I can rely on mom, I can rely on dad, I really have a family. I might have two houses that could be better or worse, but I have people I can rely on. But sometimes people get really devastated in a divorce, right? And they fall apart, can be either the man or the woman or, you know, whichever person in a same-sex marriage too. I didn't mean to use the wrong language to describe this. So it's not divorce, it's how the child experiences the divorce. And how the child experiences divorce is based both on reality and on what that child brings to the situation. That's what you're saying. A child who is internally secure is different than a child who is already insecure. Yes. I um, I was very, you know, surprised to find out that you had titled your book originally Careless Love. It's a shocking title. And then you changed it. So tell me a little bit about that transition. Well, you know, I'm still thinking about how that transition really happened when I feel I had actually, as my mother got older, a loving relationship with my mother. But I did harbor a lot of grudges. And it was my daughter who also became a psychotherapist. She went to social work school, became a therapist. One day she said, Mom, you're harboring a grudge because what happened to you was traumatic. Should I tell that in three sentences? So the trauma that really scarred me, I would say, and I never thought about it as a trauma until trauma became part of our everyday conversation, was that my mother told me I was going to a birthday party and I got all dressed up in a really cute outfit. And instead, she took me to the hospital. And I had my tonsils out and she left me in the hospital. And in those days, kids stayed in the hospital for four days when they had their tonsils out. Now kids stay in the hospital probably for three hours and the parents stay with them. But anyway, she told me she lied to me. Now, she had really a good excuse. Her excuse was the doctor told me to do it. But I said, that's not a good excuse. Didn't you know what that would do to me? Now, can I just tell a quick story? Four years ago, I was sitting in a lawyer's office and the lawyer said to me and my husband, we were redoing our wills, let's make an appointment for next week, but we can't do it on Thursday or Friday because my daughter's getting her tonsils out. I'm thinking, holy smokes, I'm writing this book. I said, really? When is she doing it? She's doing it on Friday, but we haven't told her yet. I said, what? She said, we haven't told her. I said, how come? She said, the doctor told us not to. So I told her my story story that it was really important to tell your child when they're having a surgery. Get her a little suitcase, a little wheelie, get her a new special teddy bear, tell her you're going to be there when she wakes up, or if you're not going to be there, you'll be there right away. So now I really accept that the doctor told my mother and my mother made a silly mistake. But I was very angry at my mother for a lot of my life because my mother was, number one, she made the mistake. And number two, she was not apologetic. She kept being defensive and saying the doctor told me. Well, the doctor made a mistake. The doctor made a big deal mistake because I was left really terrified. But I don't know. I kind of got over it because my mother did a lot of very good things. But I always harbored that. I always told that story. And every time I would tell it, I'd have like a pit in my stomach and I'd be mad at my mother. And it, it was a wedge. It was a bad thing in my life. And after my mother passed away, I looked in my computer at all the stories I'd been writing it about her. And I found so many other stories of things she did that really promoted my independence, promoted my joie de vivre. And she herself had a lot of joie de vivre. And I began to understand that I had a very jagged perspective and my perspective made me unhappy. And I wrote the story of the girl in the red boots, which is the name of my book, about how my mother bought me a pair of red boots and I was insane about them. And I wouldn't take them off to go to sleep. I'm four years old. And the next day she gets up and she's looking for me. Where am I? And she can't find me. Well, I'm out on the street riding my tricycle. That's how old I am. And I'm totally naked wearing my red boots right in front of the house, back and forth, back and forth. And I realized as my mother would tell that story that my mother had such 
positive energy about me. And it's like she promoted a kind of joyful adventure spirit that I still have because I'm still really an adventurer. And she promoted that and she didn't yell at me and she didn't shame me and she didn't say, what? Outside with no clothes, what? You broke rules, you're punished. She loved that story. She would tell it whenever she gave a toast to me. My Judy, she's always she's always danced to her own drummer. And she loved telling a good story. So why did I tell a bad story? And I think that was a turning point for me. And then there were other turning points where a therapist or a writing teacher would say, well, what about that? I'd say, oh, yeah. Well, they'd say, write about it. So anybody who's a friend or a teacher or a therapist can ask somebody to expound upon a positive moment. And that builds resilience to remember that you were loved, you were appreciated, etc. Yeah, it's enlarging that perspective, right? The scope to see the bigger picture, to add new layers, to understand the story better instead of being stuck and telling the same story telling it from a different angle, reflecting on it differently. And also I'm hearing a theme and I want to bring this up, gratitude, gratitude for the good things that have happened, because there are also positive things. You know, in my work with co-parents, right, the divorced couples, I always, at some point in, in sessions, I ask them to write a gratitude letter to one another, not send it to each other, but as an exercise. And, you know, people are in at different stages, but, the, you know, they have resentments, anger, hatred, sometimes ill will, right, towards the other person for what they have done. Their life is not the same. You know, their marriage fell apart. They blame the other party. You know, there's so many negative feelings. And when I say, well, today's homework is writing a gratitude letter to her and to him or you know, to your partner, they're like, what? I don't want to write a gratitude letter. Uh, no, this is stupid. I don't want to do it. Most often people resent and I'm like, please just try it. You're not going to read it out loud. You can share with me or not, but you're not going to send it to them. And something shifts in people always, always. You know, I love what you're saying because in order for people to get divorced, they have to believe the story that this marriage cannot work. It cannot work because we're in comp we're incompatible or he doesn't earn enough money or she doesn't go to work or they have a story. And a gratitude letter forces people to like update their story and think, you know, that may be true. This person doesn't earn enough money or this person won't go to work or this person is really an unbelievable slob or he drinks too much. And but forcing people to update their story. Could I just give, see, to get divorced, you have to believe the negative. And that creates a problem. Like I always give this as an example. Like if a guy goes out drinking every Friday night, and I mean, I'm using, if a person goes out drinking at the end of the week and that person comes home being a little intoxicated, the mom or the dad might say, oh, mom and her friends go out after work. It's no big deal. Let her sleep in the morning. However, if you're getting divorced, the person says, he drinks too much. She drinks too much. She always drinks too much. I'm really sick of this. And so a parent really can shape how a child experiences the environment that they grow up in. And we need to be very, very careful. Divorce is almost like license for saying negative things about the other person. Otherwise, why did you get divorced? Kids ask parents, why are you getting divorced? You seem to get along as well as the people next door as well as the people across the street. And the parent has to say, well, this, this wasn't working. This wasn't working. You didn't see this. You didn't see that. Those are all negative stories. The kids internalize and we don't know how they internalize them. It's really a complicated situation, right? It is. So I think I want to summarize some of the points that we've said so far. Updating our perspective, creating a new narrative, a new story gratitude, journaling, storytelling. I think when people have old stories, old grudges, doing the work alone is not going to help them. Don't you think professional help is absolutely crucial? Yes, I think, especially in parenting situations. First of all, I think, yes, I think most people really benefit from airing their grudges 
with a professional and having the opportunity to update this story. And I hope that's one takeaway for anybody listening. I read an article and it said most people are holding on to seven grudges. Oh, really? What are they? <laughs> well, you know, everybody has a teacher who picked on them, a, te- a guy who didn't call them or a girl, a girl who dropped them, a guy who didn't call you back, a friend who was a little cheesy when you split the bill, right? So it depends how important these are. But I mean, if I isn't that funny? It is. Yeah. You know, if you think hard, so hopefully most of us, I don't want to encourage people to think about their grudges. I really don't. But if you have a grudge, I guess here's something people could think about. It's about thinking about the patterns in your life. If you're constantly feeling gypped, rejected, abandoned, where is this coming from? Where is it that you learned that I'm going to be abandoned? I'm always getting gypped. This, he really doesn't like me. This person doesn't really respect me. I'm going on this. I have to give a talk and I have to rehearse for four hours because I never do a good job. Where did you learn? I never do a good job. I want to give you a great example. I have a patient, a man in his fifties, and he feels like he never does a good job and he never earns enough money. And his wife is saying to him, honey, you are brilliant. You are teaching at this great university. We have enough money. Well, we trace it back. And where do you think we go? Back to childhood. Other kids were playing baseball. His father said to him, you wash the car. He'd wash the car. And you know what? That wash was never good enough. See that streak over there? I want those streaks off. Those tires, they still have spots on. So a very critical parent can install, and I'm using the word install deliberately, all kind of self-demeaning attitudes in people. And underneath everything, this guy carried a grudge against his father. And what it came out was a grudge against himself, right? It came out, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And he wanted to hold on to my dad, his good dad. He wanted to hold on to the good dad. But the good dad also was critical. Now, you know why the good dad was critical? I don't know why exactly, because that dad wasn't in on our sessions. But that dad had been brought up in a very strict, rigid German home, and that dad had been in a concentration camp where he was treated like horrible, 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 horrible. And so that dad never got over what happened to him. He never got over what happened to him, and he did it to his son, and then his son started doing it to himself, right? He started doing it to himself. And so that's a perfect example of why it's really important sometimes to go into treatment of any kind, couples therapy, individual therapy. Sometimes as grown adults, we see that we're doing something that's not really helpful to our children. And we see our children suffer and seeing our children suffer is another wonderful opportunity to look inside, look inside and understand what has happened with this child. Am I being a little too strict? Maybe I'm being a little too neglectful. You know, Maybe they need more structure. Maybe they need less structure because I'm sure a big theme of yours is about the individuality of every person. And we don't always know what a person needs. Yeah, you said something really, I think, profound that we want to maybe, you know, mention it again or talk about it. What was done to him, right? He started doing it onto himself. Like that's such an important point, especially the people who had extremely critical, judgmental, invalidating parents, they internalize those patterns. And now they are suffering because of that. Right. And I think everybody listening knows this. Like I had a father who thought, this is not a trauma. This is just some a way that we talk about intergenerational transmission of trauma, but there's intergenerational transmission of everything, right? Like I had a father who would get up early in the morning on the weekends and he'd start making noise in the house because he thought kids shouldn't sleep on the weekends. They should get up and go out and enjoy the fresh air and enjoy the wonderful day. And you know what? It turns out I'm like that now. <laughs> It turns out I'm like that with myself. I think, what? I get up really early. If I get up late, I'm like annoyed at myself. And I think about my father. And I don't think that's a bad trait. It's just who I am. So we become a composite of the way our parents treated us. And that's nurture and nature, what we're born with. And we're all born differently. Some people are born wired with more anxiety 
or with calmer natures, right? Hey, this is Anna with a quick announcement. Authentic Parenting is a free resource, and support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Your contribution helps cover the many costs associated with the production of the podcast, hosting, producing, and especially post production. This is an ad free show, and donations are greatly appreciated. To make a one time donation in any amount that you desire or make a monthly donation, go to authenticparenting.com forward slash support. Once again, authenticparenting.com forward slash support. Thank you for your generous and kind support. That means the world to me. Now let's get back to the show. I agree. Yeah, some people are more sensitive and that trait of sensitivity can make you feel things more intensely and interpret those things differently. And you can sort of create a victim narrative for yourself because of, of your sensitivity. Because from outside, sometimes, you know, I have a friend, we have a group of friends, but one of the friends is always negative, right? But judging from outside objectively, all of us are like, well, what's wrong? You know, her life is great. She has a really, you know, this, she has that, material things, love, family, everything. Like, why is she, she's so negative? From outside, it seems like, what do you have to worry about? Like, you have a, quote unquote, perfect life. And yet, we don't know the full story, what went on in her childhood, or maybe, you know, her constitution, her personality, her temperament, you know, how was she, the way we are born? It's so interesting. I find this striking. Well, how some people are naturally happier than others, right? I love what you're saying about constitution, temperament, you know, and to me, the word I use now is wiring. Wiring, yeah, wiring. All the same. And when I went to graduate school, temperament was a very popular topic. They used to look in the nursery and they'd see some babies are sleeping peacefully and other babies are screaming. <laughs> and we don't know why. We really don't know why. And you can even see it in twins. It's like shocking when you see twins that have the same biological parents and one has one kind of temperament and one may even have physically, they can be so different, you know, they different heights, different weight, different temperament. Like I'll tell you another interesting thing. My husband is an amazing pianist. Well, let me tell you two reasons why. One reason is he practices a lot. But another reason is he is genetically drawn to this. His grandmother, his father, both of them were amazing pianists. His mother was an amazing singer with a beautiful voice. Everybody cannot play the piano like a concert pianist, even if they practice three hours a day, if they don't have that internal stuff. That's what we mean by talent. So one kid is really physically very active and coordinated, and another one is a klutz. And that's just how it is. And parents have to be very aware. You can't make every child the same. And by being critical of the child who's not athletic, you create a big problem. That might not be his destiny. That's not his DNA and his destiny. Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, my cousin's kid is extremely gifted musically. And, you know, my cousin always says no one in the family, in terms of the parents, are musically inclined. You know, from our immediate family, he says, you, Anna, are musically inclined. Maybe our son took after you. I'm like, yeah, that's a nice thought. And, you know, the opposite, I you see the opposite too, right? Some people are, they don't have that genetic, you know, parents, grandparents, lineage, but they themselves are very talented in, in something. So that's a whole different area. Let's go back to the grudges. You know, there is a quote I love by Mark Twain that I always use in my work with co-parents. It says, anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. I love that. Say it again so that everybody can really hear it. Yes. Anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. 
You know, so when we hold anger, resentment, hatred, ill will towards other people, we're really hurting ourselves. Exactly. The person who hurts the most is the person who holds the anger. Holding anger is very damaging to our physical and emotional state. Exactly. And many people who are angry, especially angry people, you know, some anger is okay. Like, I'm sure you can get angry. I can get angry. But I don't wake up every day angry thinking what's going to go wrong. Anyway, so what can people do to let go of anger? Is that kind of one or let go of a grudge? Let go of a grudge. Yeah. What are the ways to let go of a grudge? Do you find yourself, not now that you told your story, before we go into sharing some tips or practical things, are you a grudgeful person now? Or were you that type of a person? Or this was only to, directed towards your mom? I think that I, I did not really understand that that had traumatic repercussions for me and that it really wasn't a grudge. It was really a trauma for me. It doesn't mean this is a trauma for everybody, but it was a trauma for me. And that, I think, is one of the things that's so complicated for parents to understand. That, for example, I mean, you know, I live in New York and 9-11, it was some things about 9-11 were traumatic for large numbers of people. And for large numbers of people, it was not. And what differentiates the two? Well, maybe who they were before 9-11 happened. So I don't think that I was a person who carried a lot of grudges, but sometimes, you know, it's very hard to assess yourself, even for therapists, right? Even for psychologists like you and me. And that's why it's very important to do things like make a list, like to make a list and think, did I hold on to grudges or traumas? And what's the difference between a grudge and a trauma? And why would I hold on to something that happened for such a long time, except that Let me come back to what I said in the beginning. We hold on to protect ourselves. We hold on when we're really badly hurt or damaged because at heart, we're primitive animals and we're afraid if you touch the stove and you burn your hand, you learn, don't go near that stove. So if somebody does something that really hurts you, you learn to hold on to it. You learn to be wary of them, to be cautious, to be distrustful. And we really don't want to carry those traits with us forever, even if something negative did happen. So that's the dilemma, that we're wired to protect ourselves. We're also wired, if you ask me, to be joyful. We're wired to get in touch with our life force. And too much anger squishes, squashes, obliterates the life force. So how do you think about those things? And you can, I love what you're recommending about just journaling. You know, what would I really like to be doing? What's the next thing on my to-do list for myself? How do I make my life move on and move ahead rather than move backwards? And boy, those parents that you're dealing with, I know about them too, because, you know, I wrote a book on divorce because I am divorced. And I had lots and lots of meetings with parents who would not give up their gripes complaints, resentments, and grudges against the other parent. They wouldn't or couldn't. They felt like they couldn't. Yeah, whether it's a coworker, we all, you know, people have stories, whether it was your partner who cheated on you and you're stuck in some kind of narrative, whether it was your mom, like in your case, a partner, a a mother, a sister, everybody has some kind of a story. And I think, you know, I have a couple of things to say. Number one, when I work with clients, I always say like, how are you contributing to this problem? Because I want people to see that they also have a part in this dynamic, in this divorce, in this co-parenting situation. And because when they are stuck in that narrative, she did this, he did that, the blame, the guilt of pointing fingers, that's an indication to me that there is tremendous hurt. And I want to bring my attention to their emotions, to their hurt, to their pain, make them aware of it, understand themselves better, experience, feel, and all of that. And then I feel like after that, they're able to sort of separate that and not see their partner as the perpetrator, but develop that sober sense, right? 
I am responsible for my feelings. I also contribute to this situation. Another good question I ask them is, what are you going to change in yourself in this process? Like you're stuck saying she did this. It's because of her every time she does this or he does this. But what are you going to change in yourself in this process? And I find that those two questions change a lot in the dynamic and people sort of step outside of their story because that's our main job, right? Is to help them step outside of the story to see the story from outside, from above, if you will. I don't know, to have a different perspective, zoom out. Because when you're in the story, all you hear is the cacophony, the confusion, the emotions. You're you're stuck. You're stuck. You have to step outside of it to see for what it is so that you can heal. It's not as easy as I'm describing. Well, but I love the questions that you ask. And here's another question I always ask, and you probably do too. Well, you said you asked, what could you have done different? And now I've learned to interrupt people and say, so what do you think could have changed the outcome? And people are very reluctant to walk away, walk away. Can you go into the bathroom, shut the door? Remember how during COVID we learned the 30 second wash your hands? No water, wash your hands, take four deep breaths. And think, I don't have to respond. When that person says something to me, no matter how mean it is or how crazy it seems, we all always have the option of saying, excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom. That's my favorite line that I give. Excuse me, I really have to go to the bathroom. Go into the bathroom, shut the door, turn on the water, take a few deep breaths, And think, I don't have to respond. I don't have to escalate. I can walk away. And even just walking away from a very heated conversation can lay down like a cellular response. I can walk away from those feelings. I don't have to think that if I find myself dwelling on what happened, I can say enough. I can take three deep breaths and say, I'm not going to think about what happened yesterday. What am I going to do today? What do I really want to do when I take that break? What is the next thing on my to-do list? And to get people to change their focus, to change their perspective. So sometimes it can even a behavioral change, walking away. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Because you want to interrupt the pattern, right? In whatever way you can. I think another thing I want to say about letting go of grudges is when we find a person who can hold space for us, be that a friend, a therapist, most likely a professional, because friends have biased opinions and they want to just be on our side and perpetuate the same narrative. So you find a therapist or someone who can listen, hold space for us so that we can tell the story, tell the story again and again, but they can ask questions and open space for us to feel and express the hurt because underneath those grudges and anger and resentment is always grief and hurt, right? It's always like always grief, right? It's always grief. And when we can feel held by someone and witnessed by someone so that we can allow ourselves to cry and feel over and over again, I think people start to change. It's not like, oh, let go of the grudge. Okay, I'm going to let go of the grudge. But I feel like this process has to happen. That I've noticed that in my work with people, like when I slow down the process, you know, last week I had a client, a couple, and they were stuck in this narrative, right? And I said to him, I said, he's like, I don't want to feel this way. He was feeling negative feelings. And we sort of slowed down and he started feeling it. The hurt came out just a little bit. And I think that's what we need to do, create that safe space for them to feel the hurt. And you raised a really important question. When is the time to see a therapist rather than talk to a friend or your sister or your mother? And what is the difference? And one difference is often our friends and relatives simply go along with our version of the story. They simply say, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, he really, he's a creep. You're lucky you're done with him. You're lucky you're done with him. But they don't ask the hard questions like, what was your contribution? What have you learned from this so you don't have a repeat performance in your next relationship? We can't change him. He's gone. But what do you need to change in yourself? 
Uh, somebody just asked me, you know, said to me, I wonder why I didn't see what was wrong with him before. I said, that's a good question. How do you make these evaluations? What did attract you to this person? What did you overlook? Then sometimes, and the therapist will really ne- keep a person steady on that. A therapist might ask a question, there must be things about me that you don't like. What don't you like about me? Is there anything about me you might wish were a tiny bit different? And help a patient become a little more confrontive so that the next time they're with somebody, they don't just go along with it and say, oh, yeah, I love going to ball games." when really they hate going to ball games, right? And then they wind up in a situation. I mean, the divorce situation is really a tough one because people fall in love with an illusion. We all do. We fall in love with an illusion and then the reality hits and how to help people be a little more realistic. But the point really is it's the therapist who's going to say something like, you know, he's not here with us, but you are. What do you need to change? What did you learn from this awful experience? How are you going to go into the next situation better? Yeah, better equipped. Yeah. Well, well, so going back again to the ending, you know, this conversation, what are some ways people can let go of grudges to summarize maybe some of the points that we said, especially when it's towards their parents? I feel like some people do not want to forgive their parents. And of course, there is, you have to be ready for that process too. It's not like, you know what, you need to forgive your parents so that you can have a great life. I don't think that's very helpful. Eventually, people come in terms with reality, their own story, narrative. But do you think a process could be expedited? Do you know that a question that, what was your mother's childhood like? What was your mother's life like when she was your age? And do you know how often I've asked that question and people say, I don't really know? Well, maybe you'd like to ask her. Find out, just like we're trying to find out what makes you, you. Well, let's You can find out from your mother, if you can, if your mother or your father is alive or your parent, what made them them? What made them so strict? Oh, they had a very strict parent. Or, oh, they were so neglected that they almost got killed on the highway. So then when they became a parent, they became strict. Asking somebody, an adult, to think about their parent's life and their parent's story can be the beginning of forgiving their parent and understanding what made their parent the way they were. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, but sometimes I find that there is resistance even in learning about their parents' story. They're like, I don't care. She was this, he was that, my dad, my mom. I feel like that's an indication of the enormity of the hurt. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, like who knows, who cares? What happened to your mom that she became like that? I don't know, who cares? Well, we care because we know that this intergenerational transmission of everything is in a very important concept. And the mom may just have been imitating what was done to her, may have been reacting against what was done to her. And so the very strict, critical parent may simply be reenacting the same drama the same trauma that occurred in their own life. And we really want to remember that. We want to help our patients, our clients think about that. Yeah, because ultimately, if you learn about your parents' childhood or trauma or who they were before they had you, you're learning about yourself. If you are resentful to the idea that I don't care, I don't want to learn, you know, I don't want to step into that territory, then maybe you don't want to learn about yourself because you are part of their story. Without them, you won't be here. So one quick personal anecdote. It wasn't until I was about 20 that I learned that the reason my parents got married at 18 and didn't go to college was that my mother was pregnant. And I certainly had no idea that she was pregnant and that she got pregnant. She didn't go to college. And three months later, she had a miscarriage. Well, that's a big story. How did my mother deal with her disappointment? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So she, I mean, talk about mourning. Can you imagine the grief that accompanied giving up college, getting married, and then losing the baby? But that wasn't allowed in the family she grew up in. When life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So that was never presented to me as a story that was worthy of thought, 
of sharing, of grief. Now we know that having a miscarriage is tremendous grief. That was hidden. That was not a conversation people had. And so my mother didn't really have compassion for herself. And so she just thought, well, whatever happens, you know, you just keep moving along. Everything will be fine. Everything will be fine. That's what she had been told. And then she repeated the same pattern. And it wasn't out of ill will. It's just that was how life was in the family that she grew up in. And that's what's important for people to think about, that we all have inherited. And even if when a parent was really cruel to a child, it's important that they think about it so they don't reenact the same or go to the opposite extreme and create another kind of problem, right? Yeah. Well, and to end, you know, what I've learned from my work with parents is, yes, some parents are abusive and cruel. That's a fact. Like one of my clients is going to jail now because of severe neglect and abuse. And I feel for her because she was a child of abuse and neglect herself. You know, I can hold two perspectives in mind. I can say that, yes, this was not okay that she did this onto her children, but I also see her as this innocent child who was victimized in childhood unnecessarily. And those two things are true. You know, we're not going to choose either this or that. And by sitting with that duality, sometimes even a paradox is, I think, is so important in life and not having this binary black and white type of approach. But this whole estrangement movement that has cropped up in the last like 10 years where Many therapists are recommending that kids stop talking to their parents because the parents did very many harmful things. Now, I'm not really a scholar in this area, and I know that there really are harmful parents. There really are. But most parents are not harmful. Most parents are just wanting to do the best they can do and don't really know what the best they can do is. And that's why, thank gosh, there's people like you doing parent counseling. So they can come and really get some professional help because that's what's often needed. We all just unconsciously reenact the way we were raised and mulling it over with a professional can help you really be thoughtful about what is needed next. Yeah. Like underneath, I just want to say one thought that the cruelty that a particular parent might, you know, apply, you know, towards their children is usually linked, it's like equivalent to the hurt. The bigger the hurt, the bigger the cruelty. I always find that connection interesting. If someone is so punitive towards their children, I know that they are hurting immensely or they were hurt as children. And again, by bringing my attention to their hurt, unveiling that and trying to expose the hurt and have them even think about it as a hurt because for them, it's often, it's not an invitation, right? I'm like, let's jump into this pool of hurt and experience it. It's enormous. It's painful, but that's how you're going to heal and develop self-awareness, understanding, break the pattern, break the cycle all in one session. You know, this is going to be years worth of work, but to me, cruelty and hurt are the opposite side of the same coin. If someone is so cruel, the hurt is enormous. And I love what you're saying. And by helping the cruel parent be self-compassionate with their own hurt, helping them develop compassion, awareness, but they can't be compassionate if they're not aware. And often these early experiences are totally blocked, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's what you mean when they say, I don't want to talk about it. Well, that's why it's important to go to a professional rather than go to your friend who just endorses your own beliefs. Or sometimes people don't even want to talk about those things, right? So there, there are several patterns. So to conclude, what are your final thoughts or insights in wrapping up this topic? Well, my thoughts really are, is the most important thing we can do is become aware, recognize if, if you have been listening to this and feel like I'm carrying around a grudge, good, you're recognizing it. And then the next thing is to allow, allow yourself to really think about it. 
just as it is and to investigate and to ask yourself the question, do I want to sit with this? And if I don't, how can I let it go? How can I nurture myself with self-compassion? How can I say this really happened? You really were dropped off at the train station. You really were. And ask yourself, what did this wound teach me? What did I learn? I learned that I am self-sufficient. What have I learned in my life? I've learned that I know how to cope. How can you recognize that and allow it and own your own strengths? And then how can you nurture yourself? Because in the end, this is what I think we all, you and I, certainly teach and preach and believe that in the end, we have to all become our own good parents. We really do. Whether something was done intentionally or unintentionally, we have to become our own good parents. We have to learn what really makes my heart sing. What really helps me have a joie de vivre? Is this my birthright, feeling happy? And what do I need to do to make that happen? Yeah, because if you don't take that responsibility and, like you said, parent yourself, then you are perpetuating the same pattern and you are now self-neglecting, self-abusing, self-harming yourself. You're doing onto yourself what was done onto you. And I, I like that. I think that that's the work. That's the work of healing. That's the work of healing. Don't do to others what was done to you. <laughs> and don't do things onto you what was done onto you. Don't do it to yourself, right? You said it right. Say it again. because <laughs> You know, don't do the things that was done to you because it, there's two outcomes. What was done to us, we either do it onto ourselves or we do it towards others or both. I haven't thought about this. This is the first time I'm out loud expressing this thought. So it's an interesting one. What was done to me, is it always the person, you know, internalizes and does onto themselves or is it a combination they do it onto others too? I think it's a combination. Well, what we're talking about is the intergenerational transmission of everything that, you know, what was done to us matters and we wind up doing it to ourselves and doing it to others. Yes. How can we break that pattern? That's, that's, yes. That's How can we break patterns that no longer work? Yeah. Yeah. I know. I hope this episode was helpful. I, we shared a lot. You shared so many wonderful insights and practical tools. I appreciate it. You ask amazing questions and I love talking to you because we have many similar concepts and we have also some different language, you know, and then together it just creates a whole like party. Yes, it does. It does. I love you. I said this before, like I've never met you, but I'm going to this year. We're going to do an event together. We're going to do an event, right? We are going to do an event. I promise on air now that we're going to do an event in New York. And I never met you, but I've come to learn about you and love you, love your work. It's, it's such a wonderful feeling. You know, I have such respect and I enjoy working with you. And, you know, we have to really face this is a new world. We met during the pandemic. And now people meet online and they feel like they know each other. This is the new world. This is the new world. Yes, yes. That's why I love doing the live events because people come and meet you in real life. It adds a different, you know, the third dimension, if you will, to the two-dimensional screen relationship. That's exactly right. I know I have a grandson who's 15. He's, he tells me he's, he's meeting a friend. He says, no, I'm meeting him online. I think he means he's meeting. He means he's meeting him online. Okay. <laughs> well, Judy, thank you so much. It was a pleasure reconnecting and I really value what you shared. And it was a pleasure being here. Till next time. Till next time. This is great. That concludes today's conversation, my dear listener. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Isn't Judy wonderful at age 80? She's still writing, running workshops, working and recording podcasts, traveling and doing amazing things. What an inspiration. I am curious, what are your takeaways from this episode? When it comes to letting go of grudges, do you have an easy time? What resonated with you the most in this conversation? 
I love hearing from you. I always welcome your feedback, comments, and questions. You can send me a note to the email info at authenticparenting.com. You can call the number 732-763-2576 and leave a voicemail. And for international listeners, there is a free tool on the contact page of my website. Go to authenticparenting.com forward slash contact and send me a message. If you enjoy the podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or rate the show on Spotify. And remember that ratings and reviews help boost the visibility of the podcast. Yes, they are important. If you love the podcast, show your support by making a donation. Your contribution makes a difference. Authentic Parenting is a free resource. And since 2015, we rely on listeners for support. You can make a one-time or a monthly donation. Go to AuthenticParenting.com forward slash support to learn more and show your support. You can find a podcast and follow it wherever podcasts are played. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and elsewhere. If you want to connect with your fellow listeners, engage in meaningful conversations about the show, get support and answers to your parenting questions, join the Authentic Parenting community on Facebook, a private support group for people like you. And as always, connect to the present moment, to yourself and your children. Until next week, I am Anna Siewold. Thank you so much for listening.